And there's a next level. Media companies are starting to uh, start subsidiaries that will create new special kind of content just for the internet, short form, leveraging their uh, content in other areas. Now, what are the bad effects here of over-commercialization, concentration? Uh, privacy, obviously. There was a, there was a program by Facebook uh, to share personal information uh, in order to enhance advertising. People were upset with that. That failed. Uh, pluralism. There are, there are fewer voices listened to. Not fewer voices out there. There are a lot of voices. Uh, but if you are on that long, long edge of the tail, uh, you're a voice in the wilderness. Uh, advertising. More of it. Uh, some of it misleading. Uh, there is development now for uh, advertising on video. It, it, when they finally find a way to do it, that will be uh, perhaps intrusive. Um, and, uh, and by the way, YouTube, as I understand, they're going to make uh, $200 million, uh, and that's less than the streaming costs. It means they have to do something. There's going to be some, some kind of an advertising. Uh, there's going to be a change in how you are viewing those. And, and above all, advertising is unregulated on the Internet. Uh, other bad effects, just pure market power exercised on price and product. Uh, to the extent that there are pay models. Pay models, by definition, exclude part of the population. Uh, diversity of content. <coughs> Commodification of innovation. There's a, there's a startup. They have a great idea. They're purchased, and they're put into this, uh, this machine. Now, globalization also goes hand in hand with commercialization. The top 10 properties get most of their online audiences outside the US. Google and Yahoo, Microsoft, 75% outside the US. And I think Google just reached a milestone. More than half of its revenue comes from outside the US. Uh, so what the solution here is that we are arguing for a public space. Uh, because of what the gatekeepers are, uh, the internet has become a medium uh, where you can advertise, you can sell, and engage for commercial purposes. We think that it could be much more. Uh, I represent public service broadcasters in Europe, uh, and with traditional media, uh, our members have distinguished themselves with high-quality content of a public service character, and they are trying to reach their online audiences with it. Why? Not because it's fun, not because they want to be on the cutting edge, it's because the audiences demand it. Uh, BBC, for example, they have a separate web page for every single episode of every single program. Uh, because people expect that now. People expect that. Uh, now, if we can show the next slide, we're concerned with this uh, phenomenon. What, what it's comparing is the reach of public broadcasters in 2007 uh, and the reach this year. Uh, and it's dropping in almost all countries. And we are concerned about this. And this drop is occurring because of compet competitive pressures and, above all, regulatory restrictions. We are dismayed with recent policies that seek to restrict rather than empower public service broadcasters. For example, in Germany, uh, state leaders there concluded that the public broadcasters may not operate what they called an independent electronic press, and they placed limits on, the inter on their internet activities. Uh, now, public service has always been a counterweight to, these, to this over-commercialization that we've talked about, and we believe that there is a need for this balance in the online space as well. Uh, have I gone to my 10 minutes? You've gone over your 10 minutes. Then uh, I, will stop, I will stop there, and I'll just conclude that, that what is going to happen is that the, the oligopolies of big media will merge with the oligopolies of the Internet. Commercial media will make this technological innovation a sustaining one because big media has come to realize the power of its content and its learning how to protect and exert it online. Thanks. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting uh, presentation. Well, we heard in Alex's presentation that Google and Yahoo, between them, have 95% of the advertising market, concentration of the advertising market in Europe. I'm delighted to say that uh, we do have a representative of the uh, Google company, the company that everyone loves to hate uh, here, but that we all use. Uh, Marco Pancini is the European Policy Council of Google. Uh, Marco. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Very <laughs> lively. Uh, so I, I don't know if we fit more in uh, the, the cannibal or the parasites uh, metaphor, but uh, I mean, we actually we don't feel neither of these two roles. I think our mission uh, to organize world information and make it accessible and useful is, uh, is, uh, was the core of the idea of our founders, as is still uh, our, our core 
role, the role that we want to play in, in, the, in the internet world. We have to, to say, first of all, that the nature of the internet is extremely different from what we, we described so far. I think the, 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 the access, the nature of the internet is a, is a gate to access to information is still extremely important. And also the open nature of the internet is still extremely important, extremely is pre still present in uh, in uh, more of uh, in uh, in a lot of the companies which provide the services online. Uh, one one important point that I want to highlight to to, to everybody: w if we think about uh, the market, uh, the, especially the advertising market, is uh, broader than the one that we just have seen, and I the online advertising market is uh, still very tiny. And the nature of the service that we provide is uh, completely different from from. Uh, the offline world actually is uh, all of us in our day-by-day -day experience knows that we use more than one service. So maybe we can use Hotmail for, for email, uh, Google to search, uh, to post online uh, our pictures. We can use Flickr. I mean, and now actually now we, we, we are more and more seeing a new trend. Uh, people is uh, looking for information through uh, social networking, so, so through Facebook. Uh, I think this uh, variety, this uh, richness is extremely important and should be not uh, underestimated. Another important thing is, is that we don't want to, you know, hide our head, uh, bury our head <laughs> under, under the sand. I, I, I know that we run the risk, uh, we know that we run the risk to be f perceived as, as a gatekeepers, but we really want to avoid this risk because this is, a, this is very bad for us, first of all. Uh, I don't know if you have read the um, New, York, New York Times article of this week about uh, our role as gatekeepers in terms of uh, vetting the, the content, especially in relation to user-generated content posted to on, our, on our platforms. I found it very, very interesting and also found very interesting that the position that our leaders took was that we really don't want to apply this role. And this is why we are here. We are here because we think that uh, through the IGF process of the Internet Bill of Rights, uh, the, the whole IGS, uh, IGF pro process around governance, we can really find out a way to have global rules, to discuss all together global rules with a multi-stakeholder, multi-level approach, and try to come out with some meaningful solution to these uh, sensible issues of access and uh, try also to uh, to, to, I mean, we don't want to lose our role. Our role, real role is to be, to disintermediate in the markets where we, we want to be present. It's not to be gatekeepers. And I really think that if we fall into the gatekeeper's role, our, our life is going to be shorter than we we expecting. But I'm really interested, interested to, to have your feedback and to have your questions. So I don't want to lose time to the discussion. And so I want to let the discussion keep going. Uh, it's interesting that no one really wants to be a gatekeeper. Uh, that includes, I think, one of the world's uh, biggest uh, and most respected <coughs> news organisations and, and broadcasters, the BBC. I say that because I work for the BBC. Uh, we do have a representative of the BBC here, uh, Khaled Haddadi, who's from the BBC EU and International Policy Unit. And the BBC's brand name seems to have translated quite well into the internet globally. Uh, but I'm, I think, Khaled, we don't want to be known as gatekeepers either. That's right, isn't it? Definitely not. Uh, first of all, th thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just to give you a background uh, on the BBC, uh, the BBC is a publicly funded broadcast. Uh, we're funded through the licence fee in the UK. And uh, we were also one of the first broadcasters to embrace the internet in the 1990s. Uh, you, can argue, you can ask why should the BBC be on the internet, uh, but it's because it's one of our public purposes. Uh, the recent charter uh, which was granted to us by the UK government has a specific public purpose which states that the BBC should build digital Britain, which means that the you know, UK audiences should benefit from emerging technologies, including the internet. Our website is the third most popular content site in Europe, uh, just behind Google and MSN. And uh, since the last IGF, uh, the BBC has made at least two significant developments in the internet area. Uh, we have launched the BBC iPlayer. And this is a seven-day catch-up video on demand service uh, available on the internet and also on cable. This means that uh, UK audiences never have to miss the program uh, in, in case you know, the busy lives they lead. Secondly, we live stream all our channels uh, on the internet and mobile platforms, in, and this is only available in the UK. 
The iPlayer has been an amazing success. Uh, we have had over 150 million requests. And uh, one of the key successes, uh, w reasons why the BBC has been able to achieve this, we believe, has because of the open internet uh, and also of its un unique funding model. We believe if this openness is undermined and consumers are not able to access the content they want, or, or due, due to blocking by ISPs, then we will not see the full potential of the internet. In the US, uh, there has been a big debate on the issue of net neutrality. I think um, uh, Alex may have touched on this. I'll just refer to a quote by Kevin Martin, who's the chairman of the FCC. He said, Comcast, uh, which is a big cable operator in the uh, US, was delaying subscribers' downloads and blocking their uploads. It was doing so 24-7, regardless of the amount of congestion on the network. Even worse, Comcast was hiding that fact by making affected users think there was a problem with their internet connection or the application. I think this is a good example of a potential gateway problem uh, to the internet. And um, in the EU, there is a different debate regarding um, net neutrality. The EU market is different, and I think I don't know if this debate regarding net neutrality has sort of like reached other parts of the world. But in the EU, there's a different debate because we have a different market structure. There's more competition in, in the ISPs market, and also there are ex ante obligations on dominant operators in the relevant market. So the BBC supports an open internet. So we're not actually in the EU market. We're not seeking uh, strict measurements regarding um, uh, blocking of access to the internet. But what we're really seeking is transparency, what ISPs are up to. And this is what's happening, this is what we're lobbying for in the current sort of like revision of the EU regulatory framework for electronic communications. Essentially, what the BBC supports are the principles underlined by the four internet freedoms. These are that consumers should be entitled to run applications and, um, and services of their choice. Consumers should also be accessed any lawful internet content. And consumers should also be able to connect the choice of legal devices and that do not harm the network. And finally, that consumers are entitled to competition among service providers and content providers. I will just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, so those are our first three experts that we've heard from today. As you heard, no one likes the term gatekeeper. Everyone wants to be a trusted guide on the internet. Everyone wants to be net neutral. Uh, what do you think about that? This is your chance now before we go on to our second uh, set of experts to, to have your say. I'll put up your hand and say who you are and uh, ask your questions. Who'd like to go first? Uh, gentleman at the back. Um, I think we should oh. speak away from microphone. Yeah, we'll get you a microphone. And if you could give your name as well and uh, introduce yourself so we know uh, who you are. Yeah. My name is Malcolm Hutty. I work for the London Internet Exchange, which is an interconnection facility and a membership association for internet service providers and content carriers, including the BBC. Very good to hear that. <laughs> I think the panel appear to be working to vet different definitions of the term gatekeeper. I wonder if the panel would like to tell me to tell to tell us what they think, what definition they're working to each. Marco first. Definitely, for us, the gatekeepers means, uh, you know, the, the one who makes the decision on what content should stay online or what content should not stay online. And I think also the net neutrality, the definition of net neutrality, who is against net neutrality, like, like uh, some incumbents, in terms of um, controlling the access online to content from, from users. I think this, this is, these are the gatekeepers, who, the one who co can control and l make limitation to the access of the online content. Covered. I think uh, I was trying to lead in my sort of like presentation is someone who could potentially uh, block access to legal content uh, without actually informing the consumer what they're up to. Alex, uh, I define it more as uh, uh, through market power. <coughs> uh, so the, the gatekeeper is it's not uh, created out of restriction or out of uh, uh, excluding or, or rules. It's cr it's created out of attraction. <coughs> by having the, the best search engine, the best content. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the reality. It's where most people are going. 
Uh, gentleman there first. Yeah. So if we could just bring my phone. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with the speaker who spoke last about the nature of the gatekeeper. I think it's simplistic to say that the gatekeeper is a person who can directly stop a particular kind of a content. I think it's more structural. How uh, content is organized, what are the principles of organizing the contract, and who's in control of those principles is the major gatekeeping. And that really translates into the outcome, uh, whether the person has real control or, or not. And in that sense, I actually sympathize with, the, with Google. I know they understand that they're going into a difficult terrain uh, in the coming years and, and the moderator introduced it as a company which everybody loves to hate. Mm. They never wanted to be that company, they wanted to be a company which did no evil and I really sympathize, I love Google but I think keeping on saying that we know it and we were very conscious is not going to help because basically I don't trust that the nature of modern capital will allow you to take decisions which will go against business interest. I mean and that's, that's my, my uh, I'm, I'm quite sure it doesn't happen that way in modern capital. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, the BBC uh, representative said they had some principles about what is gatekeeping. And for me, the principle is to know the structure of the platform. What are the principles by which you organize the world's information, which is the goal you set yourself up to? For you, that those set of principles are your commercial secret. They are your co commercial advantage, which you can't share. And now the commercial advantage has come in conflict with the public interest. We want to know what are the principles by which you are going to organize, or you're already organizing the global knowledge system. Are you ready to share it? That was the same principle which made Microsoft the villain and now, if you are not going to be ready to be sure the principles by which you organize the information, you know what you are headed to. Thank you. Marco, just, let me just put that point to you. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Because when I do a Google search, if I search for Jonathan Charles BBC, for example, it comes up with thousands of entries, some good, some bad. Uh, how do you decide on the filtration? Because the way you decide on the filtration, that makes you a gatekeeper, doesn't it? Sorry, actually it's not a filtration. Actually we have an algorithm which check the content online and according with the keywords, with the user uh, inputted into the, the search engine, come back with the meaningful answer. And the algorithm is, uh, is, uh, is made by various elements. For sure there is a part of the, of the algorithm which is uh, covered by a secret. It's, it's, our, it's, our, you know, it's uh, our intellectual property. But more of the structure the, 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 the most of the structure of the algorithm is very well known, so it's uh, the, the content, first of all, it, we check that the content that uh, um, we are giving back to the users is uh, uh, aligned with the, with, the, with the interest of the user, so we check the relevancy of this content. Then we check if uh, there are links into this content which goes to other content which is meaningful for, for, for uh, the, the search made by the user. Uh, there are uh, scientific, uh, scientific, uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical uh, structure in in this algorithm, and um, most of all, I think it's also uh, you know, is a matter of trust, yes, uh, for sure. But also in the, your life, day by day, you can check that what we can give back to the user is fair. Also, because we we keep separated, for example, commercial information from the natural search, because in the natural search we provide exactly what kind of information uh, the user needs accordingly with the index that we provided. And in the commercial information is a completely different, uh, completely different story. We check the commercial information according with the keyword, but based on, on, on a different, completely different system. So uh, I, I, I think we are transparent enough to have uh, all the public online be able to, to make a judgment in relation to, 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 this, uh, to this practice. And I don't really, don't really think there are similarities with different positions in the past. Uh, also, the competition in terms of, uh, of a search engine is extremely lively. We have a new, new search engine coming up every day. We have the um, semantic search ramping up. We have, as, uh, as I said, uh, we have more and more people searching information through social network. So I think because of the competition, because of the vari variety, if we screw up, if we lose the trust of our user, we're going to lose our, our position in a uh, in few months. All right, Mark it. Oh. Uh, yeah, of course, Alex. Yeah. Just briefly, I think, I think there, there's a test that's going to come up that will, that will prove uh, something one way or the, or the other. There are search engines being worked on. The Europeans are working on something called Quero or Quero. Uh, there's another one called Quill or Cool. 
there's a semantic web that, were, that was mentioned. Uh, these, are, uh, these are search engines that are being developed and the, let's see what the market reality will be. Will go, and I predict that Google, because of its R&D budget, will stay ahead, because of its marketing prowess, will stay ahead. And these search engines, these new kinds of ways of searching, even if they have a better way, they're not going to have the impact in the market. All right. Uh, gentleman just behind, yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Lord Brad from i and Holdings, and we are a domain investment company and a digital media production company. Now, we spend a lot of money with Google AdWords. We have about 10 accounts with different account histories, some with high value and some with uh, some are pretty no, new. So I want to mention a point that you made that a gatekeeper is not somebody who decides that uh, which content should be shown or not. However, a year ago, you introduced quality score on Google AdWords. Now, all of a sudden, the accounts which had a history of small payments were paying much more for the same landing page and the same content than the accounts which were paying much more. Now, technically, isn't this uh, like a no definition of quality score was given? It was just, OK, Google decides this is quality, this is not. That was it. But so how exactly do you describe that? Isn't that really deciding what gets shown or not? Isn't that uh, making a commercial sense more than a general sense? How do you keep that gate? <laughs> You know that, that that that's a kind of uh, you know question coming into straight into the details which uh, we should uh, we should avoid uh, in uh, in uh, the internal governance uh, form framework. But I I I'm, I'm a, I really would like uh, that's to that's a case study, isn't it? No 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 no. no, no. But I, I'm I'm coming to to answer to you to your mm. question. Uh, I think I think. Uh, uh, this, uh, this decision, and overall the decision to try to have also uh, a part of uh, the, um, the position that we give in, in the advertising in relation to the content which the user, the, the, the advertiser provide in their, in their services is aligned with our, with our mission to, to make, to not give advertising but give commercial information. We always highlight to the, to the public that what we provide, to the, we wa what we want to provide through our uh, AdWords and AdSense services is not just advertising, it's ju is commercial information. So we tried to apply the same concept and algorithm that we apply to the content online in the natural search also to advertising information in order to provide to the user uh, meaningful, infor especially in this moment of crisis, meaningful information which can help them to make informed choice. So this is, was uh, the, the concept around. around. So we can understand that not everybody can be happy, especially when you change uh, the rules of the system. Uh, and, and so this, this can create a situation where before you had a position, then you had another position. But we live uh, with this issue every day with the natural content. And, and it's the same, the, same, the same problem when we change our, uh, the structure of the algorithm in order to not have anybody creating spam and not giving to the user back meaningful information. So I, 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 to I totally agree that we can discuss for hours about uh, this, uh, this, uh, this concept. But it's also important important to highlight that sometimes we don't want to create secrets or not a transparent situation. It's important for us to keep the, the algorithm, all the, the concept around the algorithm, uh, to protect it from people who want to abuse uh, f the, the rules in order to, to, to become more relevant, both in the natural search and in the advertising. So we are doing this also to, to protect the consumer. Right, Marco, thank you very much. Yes, one final question. Yes, yes. Uh, my name is Robert Guerra. I'm with Freedom House. I have two questions, um, or actually one comment and a question. Um, and looking at the ranking of the list of sites, I was surprised by the lack of international content. They seem all to be English language sites, with China now being the number one country with most internet users that r mention would not be made of all the Chinese search engine oh, okay. and uh, foreign content, particularly in Europe. We have also Spanish content not being there. I was surprised that wasn't mentioned. Um, but in regards to search, I mean, I have one issue with the comment that you made that Google just, you know, it's an automated uh, algorithm that does it. In parts of the world, like China, there are agreements with national governments where the automated search algorithm does not work because of, uh, you know, some sort of cooperation with the authorities. And the users cannot see certain things. And there are initiatives where you can see search results from 
Canada or the US and China, and they're very different. And so I would say that in some instances, it's not just the, you're not just the gatekeepers, you're also the censors. Well, we're going to come on to that in a second, well. actually, when we look at risks and benefits in our next section. But uh, just one quick comment on that, Mark. Yeah, I, I need to pick this comment. My last point in my, in my speech was just about that. I think it's important to keep the IGF process alive in order to not let us alone where we have to make this kind of choice, like be or not be in a market like China and provide or not provide our services in China accordingly with the, the decision made by the Chinese government, thanks also to companies who help them to, to build a, a wall around their, their, their internet. So I, I think it, this discussion is extremely important. We need to be uh, uh, conscious that it, we, we cannot leave it to, the, to company only to make this kind of decision. We need to help company to make decision in this very particular situation, but with the, the support of all the, uh, the, the, the community, the internet community. Okay, and even in this room we can see market concentration is alive and well. Most of the questions so far have been for market uh, Google. Uh, I will take one final question before we go on to our next set of experts. Gentleman there, yes. Yeah, I, I just find the, the... If you could give your name as well. I'm sorry, I'm Milton Mueller, Syracuse University <coughs> and IGP. Uh, the, the policy dialogue I think is getting a, a maybe a bit naive in the sense that, okay, let's suppose you grant that Google is a gatekeeper and uh, you want to fiddle with their search algorithm to make it, quote, more fair. What exactly is the institutional process by which this takes place? Uh, would you simply be substituting political wrangling? And then, now, Google is starting to be blamed for responding to the demands of governments to fiddle with their searches. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, the, the, the heads they win, or heads they lose and tails we win. I mean. If you're going to regulate what Google does, you're going to make it more political, and that does not, in my opinion, necessarily mean better. Mm. So let's just be aware of that. All right. Well, as a journalist, I always try to think one person's fair is another person's unfair, and that certainly is a, an issue here when it comes to working out neutrality on search engines. Let's move to our next set of panelists now. We're uh, going to look at really the risks and benefits to users. Uh, of these gatekeepers, however you want to define gatekeeping, these search engines, these news portals that we all use. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Ang Peng Hua from uh, Singapore Internet Research Centre uh, to talk about the academic perspective on this. Uh, gentlemen, if you keep your presentations tight, that will be uh, very appreciated. Ang Peng Hua. Uh, I have a, um, uh, presentation. Hi, good morning. Um, just to give you guys, I guess you guys know how big Google is, but um, I, did, did you guys read the article, Does Google Make, you, make Us Stupid? <laughs> Does Google Make Us Stupid on the Atlantic? Um, nothing personal. The way it came about is this, and, and in fact, I was, I'm going to embark on a project, and here's how make Google makes us stupid. My daughter has one folder in her computer. It's called My Documents, and everything goes into My Document, and she searches for stuff inside the, doc the document, full stop. She doesn't categorize, she has no subfolders, no subdirectories, and I learned she's not alone. Many of our friends are doing the exact same thing. They dump all that stuff into my document and then they Google it. Now, if you don't have subdirectories, you don't categorize your knowledge, how will you learn? If you don't categorize your knowledge, how will you be critical? If you're not critical, how can you think? If you don't think, you're stupid, right? <laughs> I don't care about that, so I care about my daughter. <laughs> anyway, you can see Google has some uh, impact on our personal family lives here. <laughs> um, I'm uh, also with uh, this group now, Mudra, uh, Institute of Communication Research. I'm actually living in Ahmedabad uh, for, six, for a year, and I'm through six months. I'm a sabbatical from my university, Nanyang. Okay, um, and actually we had a project uh, earlier in the year uh, looking at gatekeeping. Uh, and uh, you met, some, some of you will probably know you follow the debate. Marcel Makil is the one who been kind of looking th into this area uh, in Europe. And it's interesting that uh, a lot of the, 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 the speakers here are from the European side, and one sort of a defender of Google is, uh, is, our, is our friend here, Milton Mueller, who's an American. Okay? And, I was in, and, and part of it is the fact that Google is an American company. Uh, and there's sort of uh, an American and rest of the world kind of debate uh, here as well. Okay? Yeah, next uh, item, please. Next slide. So I have just uh, four, uh, four other slides, okay? Uh, so I think you know the location of sites is through search engines. Uh, we all know that now. Um, used to be 
eons ago in the last century, you had proper directories and all that. And uh, I had a friend who actually sold his directory to a search engine for $5,000. So he had a listing of, I don't know, a few thousand sites and then you actually sold it. We can't do that anymore, right? Um, second point is that both users and the search engines themselves seem unaware that they're filtering or they're gatekeeping. Uh, when Google first came out, Google News, I met this young engineer from Bangalore. Uh, in my university, he was presenting to a lot of the, the, the computer engineering uh, graduates, the undergrads, um, and I asked him, you know, what are your values in the news, you know, Google News? And he said, we have no values in Google News. It's just algorithm. And I had no other question to ask him after that, like, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, I mean, uh, and Marcus, you seem to have this idea that you're not gatekeeping either, we hear that. But I think the rest of us, or most of us here, feel that maybe you are a gatekeeper, right? Um, and I put here this point that um, the filtering by commercial entities does not violate US First Amendment. There's a group that's fairly active in this area, uh, the civil libertarian groups in, in the US, and I, and I deal with that because my own work is on content regulation. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, the issue is very quickly, and, uh, and uh, as Jonathan has said, sort of an academic approach is that uh, the first issue is that because the rules are made within a company, they are so-called undemocratic. Now, I know democracy is good, undemocratic is bad, but this is neither good nor bad. It's just not debated. That's what it means. In a, in a, in a democracy, you debate the rules, but companies make the rules, they don't debate the rules, right? You can be sacked for having a uh, totally uh, legitimate uh, screen, I mean, a, a not, not, not illegal content uh, screen on your, on your uh, office computer, and you can be sacked for that, right? Uh, I know companies sometimes ban eBay, uh, from their uh, uh, computer screens, and if you have that, you can be sacked, okay? Um, but it's uh, an un uh, undemocratic process, and the reason it's important for us in a you know, democratic approach is that Google is huge. It's 95% of the market, as I said, in, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, and we use the term uh, as a verb, uh, Google, uh, to, to its credit, of course, you know, does a very good job, uh, but it is uh, affecting us in a way that we did not expect. And I, so I think we expect a little more once you, you are so big, you know, um, and influence uh, uh, people that, to the point that your, your, your company's name becomes a verb. Uh, and the rules are sometimes hidden for commercial reasons, as Parminda has said. Okay, I think he's, uh, and he took my, my point, I know, Parminda. I mean, you know, I don't have to say any more. Uh, and then the concern, of course, is this point that the rules may be unethical, not illegal, not illegal, okay, maybe, I don't think uh, Google does uh, uh, evil in its uh, illegal sense, but it may be evil from an unethical sense, okay? Uh, and uh, and eth ethics, of course, does vary from country to country and from uh, context to context. Okay, next point here. So uh, what are some possible solutions? Uh, and I think Milton talked about uh, um, law, and, and I don't think that law is the way to go. Uh, I don't think law is the way to go because for gatekeeping, um, you need a judgment call, and I don't see that, um, you know, for, for judgment calls, you can have a law for, for that. I think it's very difficult. Uh, and so I guess the question will be then, where can we look for some possible solutions? Uh, and so the obvious one will be a professional code of ethics. Uh, meaning that Google should say, well, this is our code of ethics. This is what we do in gatekeeping, in guiding you, sorry, to information. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, this is what we promise to do. Now, uh, a, a professional code of ethics, there is, of course, there are issues with, like, you know, how do you punish Google? How does Google punish Google, right? Okay, so you need your own internal uh, mechanism for handling that. How do you self regulate right? You uh, violate your own code. And then, um, Pamina has also mentioned this. You need, you need clear values and principles. For your code of ethics, you need a clear set of guidelines as to how are you going about in this, uh, setting up this code of ethics? How do you behave? You need those values and principles. And when it comes to values and principles, you have a hierarchy. And so, okay, this is where your debate comes in, you know. Uh, why is this value more important than another? Why is a freedom of expression more important than somebody's, um, say, somebody's lives? Or why is freedom of expression maybe more important than, say, uh, justice or privacy? You know, where do these balance, where do these forces balance out? So I think you need um, this code of ethics. You need uh, a hierarchy of values and principles. And then th that's where the debate comes in. I think that for, let's take, let's take uh, journalism, because many of us are familiar with the media. Uh, these codes of ethics have developed over time. And so to some extent, I agree with Paminda also that you know, we, are, we are not giving Google that much time. I mean, it's a fairly new company still, and this is all a fairly new concept to us. Uh, and I remember um, when my colleague Marcel uh, asked you know, about holding a seminar in Singapore, I said, yeah, you know, that's, yeah right, that's a, that's a good issue. Uh, that, you've, you, that you talked about, that, you know, I've, I've not thought about it before, uh, that, you know, search engines do filter you and then uh, get, do, they do act as gatekeepers, and then we have to decide, you know, based on what they have given us. 
Um, so these are issues that are still fairly new and fairly current on the, on the horizon. Okay, my final slide is, is this. We need a good crisis. Right now, we don't have a real problem, no? There is no real problem. So we need a good, not a crisis, but a good crisis. Okay, thank you. That was uh, very interesting and very entertaining. Um, <laughs> We've, we've touched on one of the issues for society. Uh, we've mentioned the, the China issue. Uh, let me call on now Murali Shamugavelan, who is from Panos uh, Civil Society Organization, to talk about the issues as they see it from a civil society point of view. And, and obviously, it comes into the ethical issue. It, quite a few issues are raised here. Murali. Thanks. Can I, oh, okay. um, I'm not going to repeat um, much of the things that others said, especially uh, coming uh, what Parminder said, market control, market power, and other things. But um, probably um, kind of highlight the way we see the problem, I mean, at least from Panos, and then um, potentially moving, I mean, then moving on to the kind of risks we see. And most importantly, I would like to highlight um, a new gatekeeper that's coming into scene, which has not been mentioned in this forum so far. So that will be my probably my key point, if you like. Okay, the way we see it, we have got. I mean, um, there are three types of gatekeepers. Um, it's not something new, but the, I'm just kind of organising my thought. Um, the first one is obviously a commercial gatekeeper for market profit and other things, and you also have a non-commercial gatekeepers, uh, by which I mean the, the most influential actor like state as a gatekeeper in many situations um, that needs to be recognized so we need to move beyond uh, we need to move beyond commercial keepers and also keep an eye on state as a gatekeeper but the most interesting or rather dangerous combination like what you mentioned uh, robert um, is the third category combination of commercial and plus state <coughs> so we you kind of up against this like really interesting strong combinations to be honest um, as a result uh, i see the following as or sort of a developmental risk um, I mean, we, people talked about user-generated content and so on and so forth. You know, the the the, the, the amount of traffic that's rooted to uh, user social networking side, which are generated normally content generated by users, all fine, good, romantic. But um, if you look at places like Africa, where user-generated content is really less, um, and then where they in a situation where gatekeepers actually uh, are major content providers push their content continuously in, in a particular way and coupled with the problem of like uh, they have no local co in a lo uh, internet in local languages and access issues and so on so you're actually talking about a wider bigger development problem and challenge here that needs to be tackled it's just not about um, um, talking about um, the English um, trafficking and the market power and so on and so forth it's got a wider developmental implications linked to that if you it's going to disincentivize many um, non-English users um, and that, so even if there's going to be access who's going to use the content there uh, so that's a there's a dearth of local content B the content is pushed from the top so it's, it's great that that's that's a massive problem from our point of view so that's one major risk developmental risk if you like uh, and this, I mean that's linked to pluralism obviously um, it, it's um, um, what kind of a pluralism mechanism you're talking about and uh, there's a whole set of principles um, uh, we've actually you know evolved and developed over a period of time um, um, learning from the experiences and challenges from traditional mainstream media sector and um, how are we going to actually you know use and take a step back and reflect on that and apply into this or maybe re reflect on each other and reinforce that that's not been happening at all I mean how do we actually learn from those past experiences that's something that we need to actually um, um, pay attention to. Um, and and this, uh, the third thing is obviously um, transparency accountability, which was touched upon. The only thing that I'd like to add, uh, the sophistication doesn't make any justification. You know, the corporate sophistication when it comes to, um, um, when, it, you know, when it leads to lack of transparency, you may call it whatever by name, algorithms and whatever, whatnot. Um, but it's, at the end of the day, it's a corporate sophistication. If the same thing was done by state, we're talking about, the, you know, there would be a huge cry but simply because it's actually done by commerce and as Ben said that the rules were set without any public consultation so that sophistication is no justification so we need to actually unpack those particular key concepts and values if you like 
Um, and, and, and another thing, I'm to, uh, you know, one, one of the another major um, challenge we're facing, there's a deafening silence about this issue um, uh, in, in, in general public domain, especially in developing societies. I mean, it's good we're talking here, but, you know, to a general person, it just doesn't make any sense. So as a result, these sort of things, rules and decisions can easily be made on an ongoing basis. So there is a potential problem. So civil societies like us have to really, you know, um, raise awareness and um, promote this dialogue and debate around these issues. A uh, good example is in Canada, the Canadian uh, Radio and um, um, Telecommunications Commission, CRTC, um, is now considering to uh, look at um, what kind of um, um, rules they should bring in so that um, co you know, providers can prioritize that content or not. Um, you know, there are some, some debates going on in Canada, but you know, I've been speaking to people. So is it, you know, yeah, so there needs to be a lot of debate, even in, you know, the, the, reason is if they, the, the reason is if they're going to actually promote, implement some rule that's going to potentially promote favoring content providers to prioritize the content the way they want to, it might have a larger repercussion in the overall media and communication sector. So, you know, it, you're setting up a huge, big president. That's, that's a big worry. Um, the last one, but most important, I think, is um, the new gatekeeper. Um, um, we, we keep talking about gatekeepers in the more mainstream, traditional, I mean, um, commercial mainstream sense. But there is a new gatekeeper, scholarly media industry, using technologies to their advantage and as a result forcing educational sectors to pay enormous amount of money, exorbitant price. Um, like 20 years ago when there was no, um, this kind of, there, there was no system of uh, accessing um, peer-reviewed journals online, um, people go to universities, there's a hard copy, you can just read and share and talk to people, share knowledge. But now the kind of system they're introducing more and more academic journals are going online. They are going to be, uh, m you know, probably 10 years down the line, I don't know. They'll stop producing any, you know, paper copies. And each library is now is entitled to actually go through this like, a number of users and pay accordingly. So you can't even actually, you know, a student can't, you know, it's, it's, it's very expensive. I mean, to give you the, a, a, a figure, the UK alone spends about nearly 24 billion pounds per, per year. Uh, the universities spend 24 billion pounds towards uh, subscription. And they are mostly, you know, most journals are available only online. And that has a huge repercussion on education and access to knowledge. And uh, that's actually progressing. And there's very little debate on that area. And these scholarly media companies are using technologies to their advantage and becoming a fast, aggressive gatekeepers. And imagine that, that effect in developing societies. That is something to be considered. Um, there's one benefit, if I may say so, uh, through web filtering. I mean, at least the way I see it, um, when it comes to child abuse and porn, that could, you know, there's, there's a potential opportunity. You can actually increase the um, filtration and uh, protect children. But that requires, you know, lots of other issues like, you know, recognizing dot triple X and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, that's another issue, another discussion. Right. Thank you. Really, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think uh, let's pick up on one of your points towards the end of there, which is the way business companies are becoming gatekeepers in a way of knowledge. Uh, we've got from Microsoft, uh, Sheriff Hajar to talk about the business perspective of this, Sheriff. Uh, no, I'm not oh, you're not, <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. Much, <laughs> forgive I'm me. Right. I have got you on my oh, list, actually. Yeah. Ah, no, no. No. Ah. Uh, uh, where are you from? Yes. Ah, okay, right. Uh,